is a celebration. Today we can be excited because he is not here. He has risen. He has risen. My goodness. And so here's what we're going to talk about today. This is a series, this is a message that has been on my heart for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I'm so glad that I finally get to release this word. But today we're talking about the power of remembering. The power of remembering. If you're taking notes, that's the title today. The power of remembering. The power of remembering. You see, um, in 2 Peter, Peter is writing this letter and there's a moment in the scripture in, uh, in, in 2 Peter that talks about the power of remembering. 2 Peter 1. Let me get there, sorry. All the way to the back. Second Peter chapter 1. Starting in verse number 12. 2 Peter chapter number 1, starting in verse 12. It says, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Listen to this. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right. As long as I am in this body to stir you up by the way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, listen, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able to recall these things. At any time, be able to recall these things. I think it is so important because Peter is saying, my days are numbered. But with the last days that are numbered, I need to help you remember all of these things that the Lord has spoken to you. He said, it is my duty before I'm gone to let you know so that at any moment, in any circumstance, any situation, you can remember that God is faithful and that he is good. There are three reasons why it's powerful to remember today. Number one, the reason it is, is we give grace to others. It's powerful for us to remember what God did for us. Why? So that we can give grace to others. There's a problem going around the world where the church is just tearing apart lost people. There's a difference between standing up for the word of God and tearing down lost people. We're fighting with those who are completely running around in darkness and have no clue they're lost. And we forget where God brought us from. That we were once sinners. We were once lost. We once needed someone to look at us and say, hey, I will carry that for you. You take my burden and my yoke, which is light and easy. I paid the price for you. We have to remember it because a lot of times, listen, we grow callous to the message of the cross. That's why you can go through an Easter weekend and not even get excited about it. Because you don't remember that moment that you crawled to Jesus. You crawled to him. You crawled to him and you forgot who you were before the cross. So a lot of times we tend to not give grace to others who haven't given their lives to Jesus. Now there is a balance to this. Remembering who you were before the cross. There's a balance to it. Because if you remember it to a point where the enemy uses it against you to keep you from advancing, that's a negative reminder. That's a negative memory. That's not what God is saying. That's not what these scriptures are telling us today. And that's not my message, to remember who you were and then lock up in shame because all of that has been forgiven. But it's to remind you to have grace for someone else who might have been in your shoes when you didn't know Christ. Can you remember the place when you came in contact with the Lord? It might have been in a church like this. It might have been at your school. It might have been at a campground under a tent. It might have been in your living room. It might have been at a dining table. It might have been, I have no clue where your story is. And I know if we just began to go around time after time, we would just be weeping, hearing the redemption story of God's people. But it's important for us to remember where he brought us from. And Ephesians chapter 2 is a beautiful picture of that. So turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 2. 
starting with verse number one is where we're going to begin. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Hey, saint, at one time, you followed the spirit that's now at work in the children of disobedience. Reminder, this is who you were before Jesus. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. Woo! Anybody have a but God moment in their life? Hey, this is who we were. But God came on the scene. But a moment changed everything. And can I I stop for just a second? Some of you in the room, your but God moment is today. Your moment is today. You thought you just came because it was Easter and your mom invited you or someone in your family said, you should come with me to Journey Church. Or you met a random stranger at the store and they invited you to come to church and you came today, but the Lord has orchestrated every piece to say, hey, that shame is heavy. That darkness you're in is dark, but darkness is like light to me and shame has no place in my presence. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Mm. But God being rich in mercy. Can I tell you something? If there's a different picture painted of God in your mind, that's not what his word says about him. That's not what the word says about him. The word says that he's rich in mercy. You know what that means? He's got plenty. He's never going to run out of mercy. He's never going to run out of mercy. It's not, hey, you did it too many times. I can't forgive you this time. I'm rich in mercy, full of grace that I'm going to give you because it's by grace you have been saved. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Mercy's not receiving what we do deserve. So now we walk in this life to know that Man, he could really make me pay for what I've done. But because of his grace, I have been saved and set free. I'm passionate about it. And call it to your memory today because we all have been at that place. We've all been in a moment where we crawled into a church or we crawled to grandma's house at the dining room table or we sat on that couch watching the televangelist on the TV or we listened to our children's pastor or wherever you were, you were just full of shame. You knew everybody looking at you knew exactly what you did wrong that week. But there was one person that didn't look at you that way and his name is Jesus. Listen, we call to memory a moment on the cross Can can I tell you something? We remember that moment while he is looking ahead into our futures. We look back to a place while a place of looking ahead. That I'm staying here because it is the will of the Father. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even in a moment, he could have said, you know what? Strike them dead while I'm watching them before I die. He said, no, I'm rich in mercy and I'll save by grace. Oh, he's good. He's good. Listen, we were all lost. We were all children of wrath. Who are we to point fingers? Nothing good comes from us. We need him. We need him. Look at this quote from Stephen Runge. It says, The significance of being made alive in Christ is only fully understandable when we recognize just how lost we were in our sin. We weren't just dead. We were under Satan's power and the world's influence. God's love is amazing, but it becomes even more awesome as we consider the context in which he gave us new life. He loved us even when we were children of wrath, seemingly unlovable. To the person in the room that feels unlovable today, can I tell you something? God's love goes beyond that. We sang a song about it today. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough. And here's the beautiful thing about it. God knew it. God knew we couldn't do enough. God knew we couldn't live a holy, righteous life enough to pay for it ourselves. And he said, if they can't do it, I'll take care of it. I've got plenty. I will do it for them. When you seemed unlovable, 
he still expressed his love to you. Come on, somebody. I'm here to tell you today, there's hope. There's hope today. That yes, he's watched every moment. He's seen you be led astray by the enemy. You've listened to the lies of even the the, the church world trying to tell you this is who God is and that's what God is. And it's blurred the picture. Can I remind you, just get back to the cross. Get back to his word and allow him to show you who he truly is. Because he loves the unlovable. Oh, we got to remember how good he is. Number two, the reason we remember is we stay connected to the Lord. It keeps us connected to the Lord. Pastor, what do you mean by that? My favorite book of the Bible used to be Luke. It used to be Luke. I love the book of Luke. But as I've gotten older, my favorite Bible character is Moses. I love Moses. Love his story. Love everything about him. I love that he got mad and hit a rock because he was mad at somebody. Because sometimes we all just get mad when it hit something, right? Praise the Lord. Hey, I like him. He get mad real quick. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But he's now, listen, there's a transition in the children of Israel's life. They're going from the wilderness to the promise. There's a lot of times in church where we're going from our wilderness to our promise. And if we don't remember what the Lord has brought us through and where he's bringing us, we lose connection with him. So it's important to remember Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 4. I didn't tell you all my favorite book is Deuteronomy if I didn't finish that statement. Deuteronomy is my favorite book in the Bible. This is Moses' final like, letter to the children of Israel. And he's just reminding them of all the good things. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. You can go ahead and go there. Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 4. Oh, man. For all my guests in the house, I love the word. I love this word right here. And my goal is to portray it in such a way that you fall in love with it as well. Because everything I'm speaking to you is from here. Everything I'm expressing to you, and there's another verse in just a minute that is incredible. A.B., just wait. It's about to get good. Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 4. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the, supposed to say, Lord, your clothing did not wear out on you and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Can I pause for just a second? Some of y'all, that's a miracle. Y'all's feet swell 20 minutes into the day. He's a good God, Lord. I need that anointing. I don't need my feet to swell today. I need them for 40 years. Come on, somebody. You can read the word that way. It's okay. Everybody's like, what? But he's saying, remember, y'all just went through. Your clothes didn't wear out. We're all buying new clothes for Easter. We're all like, man, we got to get up there and look sharp. He's like, y'all been wearing the same thing for 40 years. Yes, I noticed y'all didn't change. Nasty. Ah, I love the word, man. I'm telling you, it's so good. All right. But God didn't allow your clothes to wear out, your feet to swell. He fed you with something you didn't even know. He made it so incredible and such a miracle that your fathers couldn't even explain it. You couldn't explain it. You ever been in a moment in your life where God provided for you and you just couldn't explain it? You just couldn't make it up. And for those of you that hadn't seen it, ask somebody next to you. You ever seen a moment in your life where God provided in such a way he's never provided before and you couldn't make an explanation for it? That's because that's how God works. Because if he can do it in my way, it means I can take credit for it. And God is saying, no, 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 no. Let me get that credit. Here's my favorite part right here. Deuteronomy 8. This is 11 through 19. It's a few verses, but I want you to take care. I want you to, I I was reading the scripture. I want you to take care to listen to the scripture. (laughs) Do I need to slow down, babe? Am I going too fast? Okay, sorry. I'm so pumped. (laughs) I've been up since like 3 o'clock this morning. 72 coffees, a little shot of espresso. (laughs) We're going to be here till 3 o'clock. I hope y'all didn't set your ovens. (laughs) Just kidding. All right. 
Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes. Wait a second. Take care to make sure you don't forget to keep his commands and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Hold up, hold up. You want me to obey the voice of the Lord because it's for my benefit? Yes, children of Israel. Yes, person at Journey Church on Easter of 2024. The Lord didn't set those things in place to box you in. He set those things in place to protect you. He set them in place to protect you. Because he knows way better than we know. So, continuing on. Which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them. And when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Well, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. Who brought you water out of the flinty rock. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end? Hold on, go back. He tested you. And humbled you to do you good in the end. Okay. Okay. So when God, I'm walking through a circumstance or a situation in my life, God's not doing that to punish me. He's doing it for my for my good. Because God's promise is that he'll make all things work together. He didn't promise that nothing bad would happen in our lives. He just promised that I'll make sure to work it in your favor if you stay in love with me. You stay in love with me, I'm going to work it for your favor. There's e- when sin entered the world, that's when everything went crazy. So when people are like, how can God let bad things happen to good people? Sin entered the world. Now there's two things fighting against each other, and then life happens. Things unfold, but what God has promised is why he's good. Why we can stand and raise our hands on an Easter Sunday is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. My eyes are going to and fro, looking for those who love me. I picked you up out of the miry clay, set you on a rock. Dark is like light to me. No matter where you go, valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil, I'm with you. He's promised to never leave us nor forsake us because he wants to do good for you in the end. All right, we can go to the next one now. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand. Have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. That he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God. If you forget the Lord your God. And go after other gods. And serve them and worship them. What is that? Work. Money. Women. Men. Drugs. Alcohol. Anything labeled sin, anything that's not big G God, going after crystals, going after people in your life, going after politics, going after anything that is not big G God, that is not of God. If you go and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Can I tell you something? You might not die a physical death, but you will, you will suffer a spiritual death. Because you have surrendered your heart to the rule of a little g-god. And God cannot put his hand into that. Because you've stepped away from his covering. If his name is on it and he's in it, he's for you. But the moment you decide to walk away and step into something totally different. Because I know me, I got me, I'm going to get mine. And you walk into that, you will suffer A spiritual death, and you wonder why your happiness is gone, your joy is gone, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your gentleness, your self-control is gone because you've died a spiritual death because you're chasing other gods. And Moses is saying, if you don't remember the Lord, you're losing connection with him, and you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. Woo! 
Told y'all Deuteronomy was good. That's like seven verses. Probably a little more than that. But Moses knew once the children of Israel were living in the promise, they would forget who got them there the whole time. All we want is the promise. All we want is the the promise. I I love that it says when you build your houses, when your bellies are full. Man, ain't nothing like somebody who's hungry for God. Hungry for him to fix a situation. It goes south, we run to him. Then that belly gets full, that house fills up, we build nice things, everything starts to multiply. Hey, look what your boy doing. We can allow success and victory to get our mind off of remembering the Lord. We have to remember that we are who we are because of Him. Listen to this. Remembering fills our hearts with praise. Remembering will fill your heart with praise. So when we get into a moment and Pastor Hope goes, now come on church, let's praise the Lord for a moment. That's why most of us are like, And this, listen, that's not me condemning you. This is me to help you because if the enemy can silence your praise, he knows he's got you. Because, let me tie it all together, because the word of God says that he inhabits the praises of his people. So if you're in a situation and you begin to praise the Lord, he's in that situation. He's in that moment. So if he can silence your praise, he can keep you trapped. If he can silence your praise, he keeps the Lord out. If he can silence your praise, he puts you back in Egypt and don't allow you to go to the promise. So this is my heart saying, dig a well. Every time I praise the Lord, Lord, I thank you for my breath in my lungs. I thank you that I can walk today. I thank you for my car. I thank you for my clothes. I thank you for my church. I thank you for my wife. I thank you for being with me yesterday when I was going through a tough day. Lord, I just praise your holy name. I am who I am because of you, and I'm just digging a well so that when I get in a season that it's tough and it's hard, like we're about to talk about point three, we can make it through tough days because I've dug the well, and when I need it, I have water to draw from. Come on, church. Come on, church. When I have need of it, I have water to draw from, and I'm not having to dig in the midst of hurt and brokenness. Because I've been doing it through all the good days. Whoo! That's why I don't wear suits. I'm sweating like a... (laughs) We can make it through tough days when we remember the Lord. Oh, man, let me recall to your memory those moments that you just radically praised the Lord. You allowed the enemy to slip in and steal it from you. You begin to compare living for the Lord with living for the world. The word even tells us when you compare, it will make it seem like the word is void. Scripture warns us of that. And so you start to compare. And listen, for momentary, it might be all right. It might actually look a little better. But in the long run, all the world has come to do is still kill and destroy. It can only do what the prince of evil and power and principalities came to do and that was to destroy you so he'll woo you to sleep in a heartbeat and kill you while you're sleeping Corey Tin Boom says memories are the key not to the past but to the future the word says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy that if he did it for someone else he can do it for me or if he did it for me once he'll do it again how do you know that Psalm 77, 7 through 12. Psalm 77, 7 through 12. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? David is going through something here. Is this how it's going to be the rest of my days? Then I said, I will appeal to this to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will appeal to all these questions with my memories of what the Lord has already done. When I feel like he ain't going to move again, let me think about what he's already done in my life. I will appeal to this, the years that I saw the mighty. The word says that the mighty, he, he saves the righteous by his mighty right hand. 
I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. How do you fight those fights? You think about and remember what he's done for you. And it changes the game. It shifts the playing field. You go from thinking you're losing to realizing you were winning the whole time. The enemy just had the scoreboard and he was clicking buttons making you think you were losing. And then when you shift your perspective to focus back on the Lord, that thing comes back into clarity and you were winning the whole time. Because God has always been faithful, we can trust him with our future. Because he has always been faithful, we can trust him with our future. I want to make it personal for just a moment. I can remember a day that I was laying in the bed next to my wife. It was early in the morning. It was like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, crying out to God to save the child that my wife was miscarrying at the time. I cried every, I, I prayed every prayer. I quoted every scripture. I called upon every name of the Lord, laying there, weeping with my wife, going, there's nothing I can do about this. Then I remember going to the doctor the next day, full of faith, full of hope, knowing that I'm about to see the baby on the screen and we're all good. And then we get there and they start going over her belly and I knew the moment they touched her belly, it's not there. I remember sitting in that room with my wife going, what now? We trusted the Lord's timing. He said, is my timing not perfect? And we said yes and we trusted it and it didn't happen. But I remember sitting in my office and someone sitting across from me, and they said, how do you trust the Lord on the hard days? And I made a statement I had made for almost a whole year, but never believed it. Never believed it. I said, you just have to trust that his ways are better than our ways. You have to trust it. And when I said it, my spirit clicked. My spirit shifted and I went, oh God, there was something different there. There was something different there. And then my wife calls me. She goes, hey, I got a happy for you out in the car. And I said, okay. And I run out to the car. Starbucks was our happy. She just bring me one and hand it to me. And she didn't. She said, get in the car. I was like, what? So I'm sitting in the car and she grabs the bag out and she hands it to me. And it's a pregnancy test and it's positive again. And listen, listen, I remember writing Baby Van Duzer in my prayer closet, not knowing if it was ever going to happen. Like, we set an appointment to go check out if, if it was us. And then we went to go to that appointment. We said, hey, we're not here checking on us. We need to check on the baby. <laughs> and then Israel was born. Bigger than life. <laughs> Bigger than most five-year-olds. <laughs> He's playing soccer, y'all. He looks like he should be two leagues up. <laughs> but I found the Lord in that season, and he drew near. That's what I want you to remember. He drew near. Yes, promise fulfilled. He came through. We trusted his timing. He came through, and I thank the Lord for that. But I want you to hear me on this, because some of you are like, well, we're still waiting on that. He never left me nor forsook me in that whole time. One more time I want to remember before... We move into this next portion. I remember a two-year-old boy running around in a diaper inside of metal studs in the education building next door where your kids are currently. I remember growing up and being nine years old in the sanctuary after kids' church, knowing that I had a call of God on my life. Not knowing what it was at the time. I, just, I always dressed up for career day as a pastor. That is no lie. <laughs> Literally. They're like, a pastor? I'm like, yes, that's what I'm going to be. Just like my dad. I can remember standing on this stage, preaching to empty pews at 15 years old, declaring the good news of the Lord to nobody. But the Lord at the time was showing me scenes like today. And... I 
had no clue what I was preaching. <laughs> Probably something I heard my dad say the week before. But all I know is, this is where this message came from. Every week that I sit on that pew, the Lord reminds me, I've cried up there in that corner. I've cried in that corner. I've laid at this altar with nobody else in the building as a teenager. Going, Lord, I know there's a call of God on my life for Millington and for this church. I don't know when it is or what it looks like, but I'm going to trust you. And I remember. Why do I remember? So that when days get hard, I see that he's been here the whole time. Preparing me as a two-year-old in a diaper running down the back halls of stud metal studs over there to watching this building being built, to standing here week after week, being the kid's pastor, probably getting your kids in a bunch of trouble. Um, <laughs> most of them turned out okay. Praise the Lord for that. He's faithful. He's faithful. And I want to call to your memory today, remember, remember, some of you have ran. Some of you, we talked about the prodigal son weeks ago, blinded by his madness. Remember how good it is to be in the house of the Lord and how faithful he is. Today, we've prepared a little illustration. There's some people in our church today. They want to show you what they remember about how good the Lord has been to them. was rich I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I
For some of you, and, and, and I want to be very transparent with you, this is their testimony. We didn't make up boards and give them to them and say, you hold this. We said, what is your testimony? And everything you see written on these cards is exactly what they thought. And so when we talk about remembering, their minds go back to this place. To remember what the world brought them to. What the world offered them, but they wound up having because they chased the world. But then when Jesus came in, we all turn him one more time. Let's go to the let's go to the let's go to the good side real quick. I think a couple people are there we go. All right. But when they came to the Lord, he took their story, covered it with his blood, redeemed it, and gave it back to them with a new name, with a new title, with a new moment. And for some of you in the room today, maybe watching online, this is your story too. This is your story too. We can hand out boards all across. And for some of you, you haven't found the better side yet. You're still chasing the world. You're still lost in your sin. And today, we want to give you the opportunity to respond to a call to ask God for forgiveness of that sin, to hand them the things that, that we messed up, and for him to take it. And make us a new creation today. So every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Today, the purpose was not only to remind the saints in the room, but remind the wayward children in the room. But also to inform the ones that are fighting hell itself, even right now. Your own flesh is telling you, you're not that far gone, you're all right. Don't answer this. Don't raise your hand. Don't tell nobody. You're good. You and God got this. And I'm here to tell you today that's a lie from the pit of hell that you've believed for too long. And for some of you, I want you to remember that sweet voice of the Lord that just said one day he loved you. He loved you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed in the room, we're going to do two things. Number one, I'm going to ask for those that want to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, whether it's for the first time you've never asked Jesus into your heart. Because listen, we can't get to heaven without him. The word tells us that he is the only way to the Father. And that is what we believe. You can't live a good enough life. You can't be a good enough person. You have to be bought with the blood of Jesus. And how you do that is in just a moment, we're going to ask you to raise your hand. And then we're going to call you to come to the front. It's not to point you out, not to talk about you, it's to celebrate you, but also give you victory over your mind today. Sometimes you need to walk it out, what you're saying, and we want to walk that out with you. So if it's for the first time today, or you just need to rededicate your life, you remember who you were in Christ, and the world stole that identity from you, you've fallen asleep, and the enemy has just beat you up while you're asleep, and today the Lord has woken up your spirit to the truth of the word of God, that he loves you. He has not left you nor forsaken you. We've walked away, but he has not. And that he is rich in mercy and saves us by his grace. If you're in the room today and you want to respond to one of those two, I want to give my life to the Lord for the first time, or I want to rededicate my life today. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand for me. One, and just hold it up. One, two, three. Anybody in the room today? Thank you for those hands. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for those hands. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else to say, you know what, Pastor? That's me. That's me. Thank you for that hand. Thank you. Come on, we'll wait on you.
everybody in the room will stand with me today. Man. Now, if you raised your hand for that altar call today, or you didn't and you want to respond, I'm going to ask you to take a huge step of faith. You're going to step out and you're going to come down to the front. We're going to have staff and board and prayer team and people come and get behind you and pray with you because we don't want you to stand down here alone because you're not alone. We're here with you today. So if you raised your hand, would you please come? Come on now. We want to invite you to come. Can we welcome them as they come today? Come on, church. No need to be ashamed. There's no shame here. There's no disgrace here. Come on, somebody. Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on. We got a few coming from the balcony. We're going to give them a chance to get here. Anybody else wants to come? Y'all come on. You're not alone. Come on. He's been too good. He's been too good. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Got a few more coming. We're going to wait. We ain't got nowhere to go. We're going to wait. Those of you that are here, I said it before, I'll say it again. There is no shame here. There is no shame here. There is no looking at you going, oh, what have you done? How dare you? It's a welcome home. It's a great day to remember how good the Lord has been and how wonderful he is. And so in a moment, here's what we're fixing to do. We're just going to pray. And we're going to ask the Lord for forgiveness into our heart to come be the Lord and Savior of our life today, to forgive us of that sin. And when we do that, He is faithful. The Word says that He is faithful to take it. And then He cast it as far as the east is from the west to never be remembered again. To never be remembered again. It does not have to identify you anymore. Remember what the Lord did. Remember how faithful He is. So if you're down here in the front for salvation, I want you to repeat these words. Church, I want you to repeat it with us. Maybe you're in your seat and you're like, hey, I didn't want to come down, but you want to pray the prayer of salvation today. It comes from here. Not a place of our head. It's a place of our heart. Repenting for the things that we've done in our life. And then when we repent, it's a complete change. We don't go back to who we were or what we were doing. We come to a place that we're different. So repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that your son paid the price for my life. So I confess with my mouth that you are Lord of my life. Come and be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.